Hey everyone, welcome to this video where I'm going to talk about tables. We use tables whenever we want to display tabular data like rows and columns on our website. Things like calendars or schedules, um, statistical data. You can put in images or numbers, um, text elements, you can even put in multimedia. Now there's two different types of tables that I'm going to talk about today. There's something called the simple table. In this case, we're referring to tables where all of our rows and our columns are set where each row and each column has the same number of cells. Whereas a complex table is going to have a different number of cells for each row and each column. We'll get into examples of doing this in just a little bit, but we're going to start off by talking about a simple table. Now inside of Blackboard, you can download the week nine demo file for tables if you'd like to follow along. I'm going to open up my HTML file and I'll start my preview right away. Now a table is going to have a couple of elements that are pretty core and consistent. We're going to have the table element and that just creates the table itself. And inside of our table we'll have a TR or a table row element and each row will have TD or table data cells. And frequently you might find a TH which is a table header. Now there's a lot more elements that we're going to cover that are available for tables and some are specifically designed just for tables. And we'll get to those as we go through. But to get us started, I'm just going to put in a table element. I'll also add four table rows inside of my table. If you're looking on the preview, you'll notice nothing's appearing in the browser just yet. In order to have something appear, we need to be able to add something to it. We specified that we're going to have four rows, but we haven't put anything in those rows. Well, we're going to add three table data elements inside of each row. I'll start with the first one. And I'm going to write in item. Notice that something's finally appearing now on our screen. The other two table data items will be price and quantity. So looking at our structure, a table contains table rows and each row contains table data cells. In this particular case, we have three cells in one row. Let's go to the second row. And to make this easier to read, I'm going to put a comment just above row one so you can see our individual rows. So moving into row two, with a simple table structure, each row and each column needs to contain the same amount of cells. So for row two, we have to have three cells inside of it. I'm going to have a total of four rows so I'll add in the cells for each row, and then I'll backfill what's going to go inside of those cells. I'll scroll this up so we can work with it just a little bit better. All right, for row two, we're going to enter in an item, a price, and a quantity. We'll say milk. We'll put in $2.69. And for our quantity, we're going to use one. Now for row three, we'll use apples for $2.89 a pound, and we just need one pound. Our last one will be bread for $2.79, and let's get two of those. So looking at our output, it might be a little bit hard to tell right now, but each one of these is lining up very specifically. All of our items, all of our prices, and all of our quantities start at the exact same space. That's because we've identified each one of our table cells as TD or table data elements. Let's take the first row and change those table datas though to table headers. We're going to swap out the TD with a TH and notice what it does to the words item, price, and quantity at the top of our table. That changes our style to automatically be in a bold text. It also moved the location of the actual item. And it's hard to see why it moved because we don't actually see the edges of our table. Let's add a style into our CSS so that we can actually see what's happening to our table. I'm going to surround the whole table with one border. Let's put a two pixel solid blue border in. Then I'll surround the individual table data elements in a different color. So there's that blue box. Now there's our red boxes around the individual table data elements. So notice we didn't get that red border around the first cell. That's because we need to refer to the table header and not the table data. So for just a moment, let's add in that we want to see the table header also. 
So now that we have that border around the table header, now you can visually see that the reason why our table header was bold and it changed location is because it actually centered itself inside of that table cell. That's a default behavior of our table headers. Notice also that the borders are producing this sort of detached and separated look. It's not very appealing. So for us to create a single border, we want to collapse the borders together. And we do that using the border collapse property. We'll add that to our table. So the border collapse property actually collapses all of the borders on the table data elements into a single border. And when it does that, the blue border on the table element overshadows the red border that's displayed. They're both still there, it's just that the blue is covering the red for right now. Let's add some padding to create some space around our content for our table data and for our table headers. That's better. Okay, here's a good one. Let's center our table onto the web page. Now to center a block level element, we need to know what the center of the page is. But what if our page is continuously changing its size? We don't know what it's going to be at any given moment. And that's really going to depend on our viewport. So we want our margins to adjust automatically so that no matter how wide our viewport is, the page will flex and bend so that the table always stays in the center. We do that using an auto value on our margin property. Now I could do margin left auto, margin right auto, but that's writing way too much code. So instead, I'm going to remove those and just use margin, zero for the top and the bottom because this is one of our shorthand properties, and then auto on the right and the left. Now that one line of code is going to replace the need for both the margin left and the margin right just above. So I've removed those. Now you can see that the table is centered. And if I change the size of my viewport, notice that my table consistently stays in the center of the page. That's because it automatically adjusts how much margin it is on the left side and the right side so that they are equal values. Let's make the width of our table 70%. Now when we do this, we're setting the width to be 70% of its container. In our case, the table is inside of the main element. So however large the main element is, our table will always be 70% of that main element. Let's add a style to change the background color of our table. Let's try lemon chiffon. Now if we want to style a single table data element, we need to place an ID attribute on the element that we want to style. Let's say that we only wanted to style the first TH cell in the document. So I'll add an ID to my opening TH. And what happens when I apply a width of 60% to just that one ID? it forces the entire column to accept the same size. Keep that in mind whenever you're working with tables in the future. So I mentioned before that the content of a table can be pretty much anything like text or links or images. Let's change out the text for milk and apples and bread with the images that are located in our images directory. You'll notice that we already have some for apples, bread, butter, cookies, and milk. So we'll start by replacing the word milk with an image attribute. And because we're on the HTML file, we just go into the images directory and then use the milk. But don't forget to add your alt attribute. We'll do that with the apples and the bread. So there's our images. And if I scroll, you can see they look pretty good. Let's add two more rows for cookies and butter. Let's take a look. Looking good, looking good. Uh-oh, the images look nice, but it would be a lot nicer if they could fit into the size of our table cells. We can do that by applying a width of 100% to the images using CSS. So I'll add in images as my selector and a width of 100%. And now all of our images are the same size. So if I were to grab my page and move it, you'll see that my images are always going to fill the table data cell. We can do more. Let's add a pseudo class hover selector to the image so that we get this drop shadow when we mouse over it. So the hover pseudo class, we can apply that to any element. And now when I hover, it kind of looks like the image is coming off the page. So I mentioned before that there were other elements that were available to us for the table. Well, we can describe our table rows as belonging to like a header or a footer or the body the same way that we could for our actual document by using T head, T foot, and T body elements. So for example, let's look in developer tools.
and let's inspect our table. Look how Chrome automatically added a T-body element to our table. Since the table should have the T-body element, and if we don't add one, the browser does it for us. Let's go back and examine the table head. I'm going to scroll up to the top of our table, and I'm going to add row 1 into a T-head element. And just to make it look different, I'll style that element with a different background color. And I'll increase the size of my table header elements that are inside of my table head element. And for just a little more room, I'm going to close my Explorer for a few moments. Let me scroll into my HTML to show you more of my rows. Because I want to talk about how to alternate the background color of our rows so that we can sort of increase that legibility of the table. Now we could go into the HTML and add a class attribute to every other row and then give that class a different background color. But there's a better way to do that because we have a pseudo class selector that's designed to make that a lot easier for us. We call it the nth child selector and this matches children of a certain element. We use a number inside of our parentheses on the nth child to determine which descendants we want to target. Let's say, for example, we had a paragraph and we were targeting the nth child and we had the number 2. This is matching every paragraph element that is the second child of its parent. I'm going to remove the comments from the table to help us to see what our rows are. Let's give our HTML just a little more room. Let's write another example. We're going to say table row, nth child, and we'll put in the word even. Now what this is doing is matching every table row that is the even numbered row of its parent. And I'll fix my typo because clarity is nice. All right, so we're targeting every table row that is the even row of its parent. So I'll outline my table rows. Now it has to be the even row. So in this first one, the table row, there's only one inside of the table head. So because that's an odd number, we can't count that one. So that one's out of here. Let's go down to the next one. This milk table row is the first table row inside of the table element. So that's an odd number. So we can't count that one. Let's get rid of that one. The next one down are apples. That's the second table row that is a child to the table element. And since two is an even number, we're going to keep that one. The next one is bread, which is the third. That's an odd number. We're going to remove that. The next one is the butter. That's an even number. We're going to keep the butter. And the last one, cookies, that's an odd number. It's number five. It's the fifth row in our parent. So that one's going to go too. Let's see this take effect. I'll use table row, nth child of even, and I'm going to change the background color to white. Now, every single time that we add a new row to our table, it's going to evaluate this rule and determine which rows we're going to change to the color white. Now we don't have to add a class to the HTML, and it's dynamic, so it won't matter how many rows we add in the future. This will always work for us. I'm going to end this video right here on simple tables, and I'll pick up the complex tables in another video. If you have any questions on this content so far, please don't hesitate to ask.